from Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21 and verse 24. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them, rust destroys them, and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Please be seated. Last week, Pastor Lonnie began a new sermon series entitled, God's Tips for These Economic Times. And in that first sermon, he inspired us. Now, if you've been around here for a while, you know that every sermon that Lonnie preaches, he has a praise that he wants us to remember. And he has it repeat that praise uh, so that we can burn it into our memory bank. Last week, that praise was this. Faith frees me from financial fears. Faith frees me from financial fears. Now, since Lonnie's here this morning, we've got to repeat it, right? All right. One, two, three. Faith frees me from financial fears. Now, the faith that frees us, we learned last week, comes from believing what Jesus taught us about birds. That birds do not sow, they do not reap, they don't plant, they don't harvest, and they don't build barns and store it away. But the birds never go a day without eating. They're constantly being provided for. And so Jesus and Pastor Lonnie taught us that Jesus said the following. If God so cares for the birds of the air, how much more does he care for you? And we'd go, he cares a lot, right? Amen. And we walked away from that sermon inspired. We were eager to hear the rest of the sermon, the rest of the sermons in this particular series. Because we're thinking God frees us from financial worry because God provides for us. And so I bet you can hardly wait for what I have to share today. Amen. Don't be so sure. <laughs> Pastor Lonnie went on spiritual retreat this week. He went on this retreat in order to prepare for the upcoming year. And so whenever he goes on retreat, I typically will preach that Sunday that he comes back. And so he asked me to preach the second sermon in the series that he had planned on God's tips for these economic times. So what did he leave me? He wants me to preach on how to get out of the financial money pit called debt. Now, this means that if he planned this sermon, that he assumes that somebody in this room is trapped in the money pit. Okay, which then assumes that my job is not to inspire, but to meddle. Now, I share that with you to help you understand why I'm a little in trepidation about sharing my message. Because it could get personal. Are you buying those expensive organic eggs at HEB, <laughs> 10 to $12 worth, or are you going down to Aldi's and getting the non-organic eggs for just $3? In case you didn't know that, Aldi's is the place to shop. Okay. All right. Let's see if we can keep this thing on today. Now, 
The truth is, debt is a huge problem in America. It may not be huge among us, but it's big in America, and if it's big in America, that means it has clutches reaching out to try and ensnare us into debt. So it might be good for us to talk about this subject of debt. Now you're wondering how big is debt in America? Well, as of September 20, uh, September 2022, the consumer debt in America was six. $16.5 trillion. Is that up there? Yeah. $16.5 trillion. Just turn to your neighbor and say $16.5 trillion. Now that's not as big as the national debt. And we're not even talking about the national debt. We're just talking about what you and I owe. And you notice that the average American, in terms of consumer debt, owes $96,371. Whoa. Now, I have a little chart that's going to go up here now. It has six categories of what consumer debt is and what the average American owes in each one of those uh, categories. Now, you might wonder why I show you these figures. You can use the chart here on the screen to determine how deep into debt you are. So if your debt in any of those six categories is less than the average American debt, pat yourself on the back and go, woohoo! Okay, I'm not too bad. But if the average American is trouncing you because the average debt is less than what you owe, whoa, whoa. Now, what these figures point out is this, that debt is a real problem. It's a real problem for thousands of Americans. Now, it may not be a huge problem among us here today. I really don't know. I don't have access to your bank accounts. Okay? I could hack in, I guess. You know. But I don't have that access. But because debt is so big in America, it could very much become a problem for us. So that leads me to our goal for our time together this morning. Our goal is this, to study the text we just read to understand how debt seduces us into its trap and to see if we can find ways to avoid being seduced into debt. That's our goal, to understand how people get seduced into debt or how to avoid it if you're not already in debt. Now, to get to there, we're going to do three things. We're going to examine three things. First of all, we're going to examine our text and discover what it has to say about the path into debt. The second thing we're going to do is have a Pastor Lonnie moment. Now, I'm sure you're all eager to get there, right? To have a Pastor Lonnie moment, and you're wondering what that might look like. I would tell you, but then I'd rob you of the joy of discovering it for yourself. So I'm not going to rush ahead and, you know, tip my hand just yet. But we are going to have a Pastor Lonnie moment. Whoa. Okay. Third, then, we're going to do what Pastor Lonnie would do or any good preacher would do. We're going to have that moment where we determine a plan of action based upon what we learned in our two first two points. What is the path into debt and our Pastor Lonnie moment? So let's look again at the first verse in our text. Matthew six nineteen. Let me remind you of how it reads. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them, rust destroys them, and where thieves break in 
and steal. Anybody never hear that verse before? We've all heard it, right? We all know it very, very well. And I wondered, is it possible that we know this verse so well that when we come to it in our scripture reading, we go, yeah, okay, and move right on. Okay, here's why. Thursday morning, Judy was at our kid's house getting our grandchildren ready to go to their preschool. When all of a sudden she realized that she had lost our two-and-a-half-year-old granddaughter, Olivia. Could not find her anywhere in the house. And so some of you who have tried to wrestle and keep two-year-olds in particular places, you'll identify with what she did. Sorry, Bruce, I'm going to run all over. (laughs) You got the idea, right? She keeps pacing through the house, looking in all the places she knows where Olivia likes to hide. That's one of Olivia's favorite pastimes, is to hide from either Grandpa or Grandma. She loves doing that. And Judy followed the familiar path throughout the house, and what she didn't realize was that she had looked past where Olivia was hiding several times as she paced. Because she was convinced that she would be in one of, of several different locations. And so she would ignore everything else but that location. Now I tell you this story, because it's kind of funny, but I also tell it to you because we do the same thing when we read scripture. When we come across a passage like this that's familiar... We look over it, and we look for the truth that we expect to find in the place that we expect to find it, because we've seen it there so many times. And we're oblivious and blind to a a truth that God may be wanting to teach us in that same thing. Now, Judy did eventually find Olivia. She was sitting on top of the dryer, singing a song to herself. Now, Olivia had never hidden on top of the dryer before, but our kids, their laundry room is in a closet along the top hallway. And Judy walked past that hallway, looked in, and looked into the lower left-hand corner of the closet because there is a laundry basket that sat there. And Olivia likes to crawl into laundry baskets, and so she would look in there expecting to find Olivia there. Much in the same way we read a familiar text and expect to find a particular truth in a particular place, and we go, yay, okay. And we move right along. Okay? Now, Olivia had never hidden on top of the dryer, but she had hidden in the closet. Judy looked where she expected to find her, but Olivia was hiding someplace else. In this text, I submit to you for your consideration is that there is a truth there that helps us understand the pathway into debt. Now, we don't normally look at this passage and think of it as a passage talking about debt. It says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. It's assuming we've got something that we're trying to get. Now, Tucked away in there is an attitude that Jesus wants us to be made aware of that we might have. It's the attitude of here and now. Now, what debt does to us is it gets us trying to store up things. Now, 
let's talk about what we're used to seeing when we look at this passage. We're used to hearing, you know, that don't store up huge amounts in your bank account. Don't put a lot of money in your IRA or your 401k. Be sure you've got some money to invest in heaven. Okay? And so right away we think, well, this is really talking about just taking every dime we have and putting it away and so forth. So to be there and that someday when you die, you can tell your lawyer, who's the executive of your state, to put all your money in your casket with you and then find out it's just a check. We heard that story last week. We all laughed and, you know, hardly at that. Okay. And we think of people who do that sort of thing, just pile money away, pile money away, pile money away. They're trying to have it ready for some time in the here and now. Now, that's savings. That's not necessarily a bad idea. But the other thing we immediately think about are things like, you know, people who have more money than they have common sense. And so they start to buy fancy cars. They start to buy yachts. They start gathering lots and lots of stuff. Because they have more money than they have common sense. And we shake our heads and pity people like that, don't we? Those of us who have more common sense than money, look at those with more money than common sense and say, Whoa, why are you doing this? We know immediately what Jesus said. Moths and rust are going to destroy it, or thieves are going to break in and steal it, or worse yet, a relative is going to break in and steal it. We're pretty sure, as average-going Americans, that we aren't that dumb to store up treasures on earth. So we start to pat ourselves on the back. We turn to Jesus and go, Wow, you're right, Jesus. That is a dumb thing to do, to store up my treasures on earth, where all these bad things could happen. And so we begin to think this verse is helpful. But it's not all that important to my situation. Because I don't have enough money to store up ostentatious things. And so we go, hmm. Well, Olivia, as I told you, is hiding in there. Olivia is going to draw us our attention to someplace different within that text. And I already told you about it. It's a here and now attitude. The here and now attitude tells us to store up treasures here on earth. Or we could say store up treasures here and now while we're on the earth. Now you're thinking, Bob, you already dealt with that. So what is your point? Well, my point is simply this. Here and now has a sinister way of seducing us to store up treasures here on earth. And here's how it works with average folk like us. Here and now whispers to you, Hey, hey, you got good credit. You got good credit. So use some of that credit so that you can get some of those treasures you've been wanting. It starts out with a siren call. You remember reading the Odyssey in high school, right? You know, the sirens out there that lure the sailors to their death. Well, that's what debt does. It gives us this little siren call. You know it well. Buy now. Pay later. 90 days. Same as cash. No payments due. And so it plays this soft 
melodious sonnet on its flute. It's a refrain we're very familiar with. And pretty soon we discover that that refrain begins to gnaw itself into our brain and it breaks down our will. And before we know it, we're saying to ourselves, we're just humming along. Bye now, hey later, bye now, hey later, enjoy it now, enjoy it now. Because we know that if we don't buy now, the price is going to go up and we're not going to be able to afford it. And so we got to go deeper into debt. So I can lower my debt by buying now and off we go. Buy, buy, buy. Now, once we give in to this soft and sultry melody, the music then changes. It picks up its intensity and its pace. New lyrics are being sung to us that suggest how we could have even more if we would use debt judiciously. A little debt. Not a lot of debt will provide you the gadgets and the thingamabobs that promise to make your here and now all that it can be. You give in to that a few times and then suddenly you notice that the bass line of the melody has gotten louder and louder. It's even picked up pace. You know, and it's starting to drive you. And you can feel the adrenaline rush. And pretty soon you recognize that the adrenaline is greater than your will. And off you go into the wild blue yonders of debt. There you become aware of all the hands that have been reaching up out of the money pit of death trying to grasp you and bring you in and you no longer have the strength or the wherewithal to withstand it. And there you are in the quicksand of debt. Watch out! Crash! That's what happens next. All of a sudden, that glitzy thingamabob that they told you was indestructible lies broken in your hands. And you look at this un- the unusable remains of this and you say to yourself, Oh no! Oh no! My thingamabob! It's broken. I can't live without this thing of a bob. It's going to cost more now. And then debt sidles up to you. Says, replace it. Even if you have to spend a little bit more, all you need to do, all you need to do is raise your credit limit a few dollars. Not a lot. Just a few dollars. And there you are, even more aware of the hands that are grasping at you. It's then that you recognize you wished you had been listening to what Jesus had to say about here and now. When he said, don't store up treasures here on earth. Instead, verse 20, he said, store up treasures In heaven. Instead of giving in to the here and now attitude, Jesus offers a then and there attitude. Jesus is offering us a new place to store our treasures that's not here. Okay? Rather, it is there where He is now. So, if you put it there for then and there, you're also. Investing in here and now because you're investing in the one who is always here and is always now with us. His name is Jesus. Jesus offers us a place to put it and offers a promise. If we store up our treasures in heaven, then moth doesn't eat it. Rust can't destroy it, 
And thieves are not going to break into the house of God and steal it. There it is, another familiar truth. Store your treasure in heaven. Now hear what Jesus is saying. Store up your treasure in heaven. Why? Why do that? Well, the answer is found in the very next verse, verse 21. I'd like for us to read it out loud together, okay? So, on count of three, let's read this together. One, two, three. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. We want to say will be also, but... We store up our treasure in heaven, Jesus said. Not, hear this, not because it's a safer place to store it. We store it there because that's where we want our heart to be. That's where we want our heart to be, and that's where we come to our second stop. This is our Pastor Lonnie moment. Okay? I want you to remember this. Last week, he taught us the truth from verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. Now, if you were here last week, you probably remember the second repeatable phrase that we heard. It went like this. We serve what we dwell on. We serve what we dwell on. God or money. Now, Pastor Lonnie shared this phrase with us to underscore that this is the foundation for living worry-free in these perilous economic times that we're in right now. It comes when we serve God and not money. Now, I submit to you that if you carefully consider what I'm about to share here, it's going to reinforce what we learned last week from Pastor Lonnie about the faith that frees us from financial fears. This faith, he taught us, had two parts. Part one, it starts with God as our master, that he is the one we dwell on, therefore he is the one we serve. The second aspect is not possible if God is not the master. That second aspect is this, that it's faith that God will provide that frees you for worry-free living in these economic times. If you grab on to these two things, you will be worry-free. We walked out of here last Sunday celebrating that we could be worry-free, and we committed ourselves to making God the master And having faith that he provides. And we heard Pastor Lonnie tell three thrilling stories about how God provided. Once for him. Once for Bill. And then for his pastor, Dr. Vernon Rogers. We walked out of here and we were convinced God does provide. Because we had three examples of God providing. So let me tell you this. If you want to stop the slide into debt or avoid sliding into debt, it starts with what Jesus said about not being able to serve two masters. If you're trying to do it, you'll never get out of debt. Now, at face value, that makes sense, doesn't it? But face value is only dealing with the familiar And we need to dig a bit deeper. I want to put verse 21 together with the second part of verse 24. Remember, verse 21 reads this way. Wherever your treasure is, the desires of your heart will also be. Verse 24 reminds us that you cannot serve two masters. Why? Because you will hate one 
Notice the emotion or love the other. Now, this is important because together they point out that serving God is not merely an intellectual decision. Yea, God, I'm going on your team. Okay? Rather, the decision starts in our heart. It's an emotional decision. Where your treasure is, is where your heart's going to be. You will love God if you put your treasure there. Now, I want you to understand where I'm going, so I need to tell you a little something about myself. Forty-seven years ago, when Judy married me, our anniversary, by the way, was January the 2nd. Okay, so we're, we're kind of... Yeah. When Judy married me all those years ago, she did not marry either a preacher or a college professor. What she married was a college dropout who was a, race yourself, a salesperson on commission. Yeah. Did I wear a plaid coat that was red? You know I did. <laughs> now, let me share with you one of the secrets of sales. When trying to make a sale of something large, what you do is you provide just enough information that the buyer can think they've made a sound decision when they ch choose to buy. The rest of the time, the salesperson is ignoring that sound information and is trying to engage your heart and emotions. The salesperson knows this but doesn't want you to know it. Okay, You make the decision to buy in your heart. That's where it actually happens. You just use your mind to justify the decision your heart has already made. That's why a salesperson will work so hard to help create an affective connection with the treasure they're trying to sell you. They don't want you to think you're just buying an item. You're buying a treasure. And he knows that if he can't connect you to it emotionally, you're not going to buy it. Christian? Christian, you've got to learn this, that God is not, is, excuse me, God is more than a theological idea that is easily agreed with or we feel comfortable with. If God is not the desire of your heart, he will never be your treasure. Now, there's no fill in the blank there, but that would be my repeatable phrase. I'd urge you to write that down on your, on your bulletin. Okay? If God is not the desire of your heart, he will never be your treasure. And if God is not your treasure, then the only other thing you can serve is money. And money then will be your master. Your heart does not have room for both. Jesus already taught us that. Your life experience backs that up. You know it. You can't be love and be loyal to both money and God. So how do we store up treasures in heaven? Storing up a treasure in heaven begins with recognizing God as your treasure. Treasuring God does not begin intellectually, it begins emotionally. So some of you might be wondering, do I have an emotional connection to a God that I can't see, who I can't here, most of the time, Preston, most of us don't, okay? Can I have an emotional connection with an abstract idea? 
So we began our service today singing songs that celebrate an emotional connection with God. The first song that we sang in the second stanza went something like this. Who can imagine so great a mercy? Now that's a rhetorical statement. Who could imagine? It's assuming no one. No one can imagine this. It's beyond our intellectual capability to understand this great mercy that caused Jesus Christ to die on one day in about 33 AD, to die on that day for all sin, for all people, for all time. I can't imagine what that mercy would look like or feel like. I can intellectually assent to, yes, there's a lot of mercy there, but I can't truly fully understand it. The second line went, What heart can fathom such boundless grace? A grace that the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 5 is greater than all our sin. He even said, the more we sin, the more God's grace increases. That's deep. There's another Lonnie moment. That's deep. The more we sin, the more grace he gives. Doesn't sound very smart on his part, but that's what he says. And then the song continued, the God of ages. The one who was and is and is to come. The God of eternity stepped down from glory to do what? To wear my sin, bear my shame. And now we break out into greater song. The cross has spoken. The king of kings calls me his own. The stanza began with two deep questions. The questions were asked in response to the actions that Jesus took to step down from glory, to bear, to bear our sin, and to take on our shame. There's a realization in those two actions because God then proclaims, we are his. So I wonder, what does this evoke in you emotionally? Or better yet, what does it provoke within you emotionally? I hope that you see that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are a treasure worth a tear. That it's worth a tear that falls from our eyes as we sing the words. Now the writers of the song and the singers then broke into a heartfelt emotional explanation. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You've broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. And then our emotional, heartfelt declaration, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ. My living hope. Jesus Christ, my living treasure. So hear it, friends. This song provides you an opportunity to store up treasure in heaven. Even if all you did was become aware of the words as I read them to you. Now, if you want to know the mechanics of how to get out of debt, you notice I didn't talk about those. You really don't need the Bible to help you know how to get out of debt. In fact, the Bible has nothing to say on the subject. Google will give you everything that you need, all the resources, all the context that will help you get out of debt. 
But what we need is an emotional connection that motivates us to want to get out of debt so that we can find something else to do with those baubles that we have accumulated and the money that we have been spending and throwing away on interest. It'll give us an opportunity to do something significant with the treasure in heaven. Hear my heart. Hear my heart, not just my words. If you don't know Jesus in an emotional, intimate way, it doesn't matter if you get out of debt. It does not matter if you don't know Jesus, if you get out of debt. If Jesus is not your heart's desire, you have no lasting treasure or even a living treasure. Though you may have lots of stuff, lots of money, you got things that shimmer and shine and creates envy in others, If you don't have Jesus, you have nothing. If you don't have Jesus, you don't have anything. And you're trapped forever and ever and ever and ever. Can you say it with me? And forever in the trap of debt. Because there is a debt you owe God that you can't possibly pay. And so we need, we need to make Jesus our treasure. Can you come up, Bill and William, and start to play for us? I want to do as Pastor Lonnie has been doing the last several weeks. I'm going to pray. And as I'm praying, I'm going to offer an invitation If you do not have an emotional connection with Jesus Christ, you need to respond. And in a moment, I'm going to start to pray that God will work among us. And that if you already know Jesus and love Jesus, that he will take this moment and help you deepen that emotional connection. But if you don't know Jesus, while I'm praying, Pastor Lonnie is going to be standing right here next to me. And he will meet with you right now and share with you the good news of Jesus Christ and how you can have and start that intimate connection. Because hear my heart, you can't get out of debt ever without Jesus. Either in the here and now or the then and there. Without Jesus, there's no way out. So, as I pray, if you want to respond, come forward as I'm praying. Lonnie's here to meet you. This is a true here and now moment. Because if you don't respond in this here and now moment, you may not have a then and a there. You may miss out on that opportunity. Let Jesus take care of you. Bow our heads, close our eyes. If you want to come and know Jesus, come as we pray. God, our Father. God, our Daddy. God, our best friend. A God who wants to partner with us as we walk through the hills and the valleys of this life, the shadows of death, in the paths of our enemies, you promise to be there. Father, I pray, first of all, for those who know you, I pray that they will come 
in their minds to recognize the importance of nurturing and developing an emotional connection. That the next time we sing a hymn to you, a worship song to you, that we won't worry about whether or not we know it, whether or not it's the style of music we like, but that we'll recognize that somebody at your leading has put down words that remind us of the majesty of who God is. And I pray that we'll put aside whatever our preferences are and that we'll embrace you as we sing the song, consider the lyrics, develop an emotional connection as we worship you. And Father, I pray for those here who may not know you. I pray that they will come to see the importance that you are to even a mundane problem like earthly debt and how you are the answer to the greatest problem of moral debt. So Father, we pray for those who need to come to know Jesus. We ask all this in the name of Christ, our living Lord, our living treasure. Amen. We are going to